All right, well, please open your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 8. All right, honesty time. How many of you have ever made a really bad decision in life? Some people are not raising their hands. I'm concerned. Um, yeah, you know, big time regret. Listen, all of us have done it. Okay, sorry to bring up any bad memories for you about that decision, but we're all in the same boat. Okay, we've all made at least one really bad decision. Um, decisions, they're an important part of life. All day long, we are making decisions. Starts early. Okay, what am I going to wear today? What am I going to eat? What am I going to do? Who am I going to do it with? Where am I going to go? How am I going to get there? What am I going to say? What am I not going to say? Uh, I can go on and on and on. Now, many of those things might seem harmless, uh, but Experience tells us they're often not harmless. Small decisions can often lead to bigger decisions. Um, wrong place, wrong time, wrong people. Um, and before we know it, we find ourselves on a road that maybe it seems right, but it's leading to the wrong place. Okay, so we all know this is true. Uh, we've all made some bad decisions that we regret. But somehow we, we wake up every morning thinking, well, this day will be different. Uh, this day will be better than yesterday, hopefully. See, we, we make the mistake of, of just being wise in our own eyes, uh, which is not a good idea. A new day does not necessarily mean a better day. See, we need help. This is why we need God's word. This is why we need God's spirit. This is why we need Jesus living in us, the wisdom of God uh, in our hearts. This is so critical. This is why we need other people in our lives who are following Jesus to help point us back to him. And it's why the first nine chapters of Proverbs they just keep urging us time and time again to listen, to lean in, to get understanding, to guard our hearts. Okay, 22 times in these nine chapters, we see these words, my son, my son, my son. Remember, these, these are the words of a king to his sons, to the princes, to his children who will be taking the baton of, of leadership. Now, many of us in the room here, uh, our, our kids are older. They've grown. We have grandchildren. Um, some of you have your own children right now. This is an opportune time to be saying, my son, my daughter, my kids, my grandkids. Okay, Proverbs is a heart-to-heart -heart conversation. One of the very serious times between a parent and a child where the parent wants to get the child's attention, a young adult finding their way in the world because they need to decide. They need to make some choices. And our big idea today is this. Today's choices lead to tomorrow's destination. Pretty obvious. Um, what's your destination? What's your child, your grandchild's destination? Are your choices, are their choices leading them where they think they're going? What direction is your life going? Here's the deal. We are all going somewhere. We are all on a path, whether we like it or not. And the path that we're on, it's either leading to life or it's leading to death. And there's another way to, to look at it from Proverbs 8 and 9. Either you are heading to a feast or you're heading to a funeral. 
So, pay attention. Okay, chapters 1 to 7 have mostly been the voice of a father to a son, but now wisdom herself is crying out to us. Look at chapter 8. I just want to read the first five verses. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand beside the gates in front of the town. At the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud. To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O oh, simple ones, learn prudence. O oh, fools, learn sense. Well, let's pray as we dive into this. God, thank you that, that you are crying out. You are not hiding. You want us to know. You want us to hear you want us to learn, to understand. So tune our ears to hear your call. God, thank you that you want to give us uh, this understanding. You want to give us this wisdom. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so which way are you heading? Are you, are you heading to the feast or to a funeral? The, the message here in Proverbs 8 and 9 is this. It's time to choose. Okay? Not a for a later date. Today is the day to choose. So we need to consider a few things about the choice. The first is the choice is obvious. Now, a lot of this is going to feel like review. And that's okay. I mean, wisdom is saying, have you heard? I'm going to tell you again. Are you listening? Are you, are you hearing? Um, so let's continue in chapter 8, starting in verse 6. Wisdom is crying out and says, Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There's nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight. To him who understands and write to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. I, wisdom, dwell with prudence and I find knowledge and discretion. The fear of the Lord is hatred of evil. Pride and arrogance and the way of evil and perverted speech, I hate. I have counsel and sound wisdom. I have insight. I have strength. By me, kings reign and rulers decree what is just. By me, princes rule and nobles, all who govern justly. I love those who love me and those who seek me diligently find me. Riches and honor are with me enduring wealth and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness, in the paths of justice, granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. So, listen, Proverbs is like full disclosure. Um, full disclosure here. God wants you to understand first the right option. Um, and, okay, George Orwell, famous quote, you've probably heard it before, sometimes the restatement of the obvious is the first duty of intelligent men. It just feels like the author of Proverbs is stating the obvious, uh, the right choice. It, it's, it's noble, it's true, it's righteous, it's more valuable than silver or gold or jewels. This is what rulers need to rule with justice. The benefits go on and on, as we've just read. This is the only option that leads to life, and it's an invitation to a great feast. Look at the first few verses of chapter 9, verses 1 to 6. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. 
She has sent out her young women to call from the highest places in the town. Whoever simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. Okay, so wisdom is inviting you into her beautiful home. A table has been set uh, at a feast with meat and bread and wine. And the invitation is, come, come and eat. I mean, I, I can't wait for this feast out on the patio. You know, some of your tummies are rumbling, ready. That is how we should feel about devouring God's wisdom and the life that he's designed us to live. We should hunger for it, long for it, be looking forward to it. No one thinks this option is bad. It's obvious. So what's the problem? The problem is there's another option. And full disclosure, uh, there's another voice that's calling out to us, but it's the wrong option. It's the way of foolishness. Uh, let's pick it up in chapter 9, verses 13 to 18. Look at the similarities to what we just read. Starting 9, verse 13. The woman folly is loud. She is seductive and knows nothing. She sits at the door of her house and takes a seat on the highest places of the town calling to those who pass by, who are going straight on their way, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. To him who lacks sense, she says, stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of Sheol. So there's, there's another voice. There's another meal foolishness has a house. There's a meal we could eat there, but uh, this doesn't sound like a feast. Uh, it's bread. It's water. Um, and the water is stolen. This sounds more like a last meal before you die because this house is in the depths of Sheol. It's another word for, for hell, the realm of the dead. Some translations say in the depths of the grave. So, this is what it means. This invitation to come and eat at her house, at Folly's house, is actually an invitation to your own funeral. Okay, but the wrong option is sugar-coated poison. This is the strategy of temptations that we talked about last week. They're designed to seduce you. Verse 13, she's seductive. Um, seems attractive. I mean, why else would we choose to eat there? Uh, but some simple pondering, some stopping to think carefully about the end of this decision. Uh, what's going to happen when I go this way? Stepping back, looking beyond the honey, uh, beyond the immediate gratification, should reveal how obviously wrong this option is. But even so, some people have a hard time making a decision one way or the other. So they... <laughs> Uh, abstain. You know, rather than taking a risk, rather than making a choice that they might be held accountable for, either with a reward or punishment, maybe they think, you know what, I'm going to play it safe and I'm going to try to quietly make my way without really making a choice. It's sort of a, a passive non participation. You know, I'm not going to choose the obviously bad road, but I'm not ready to go all in with Jesus either. Now, the problem is wisdom is giving us full disclosure here that there is no third option. There's no third option. Not choosing well, might seem like an option, but it's actually the back door to the wrong road. Look at chapter 8, verses 32 to 36. And now, O sons, listen to me. 
Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise. Do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But he who fails to find me injures himself. All who hate me love death. Okay, so if you want to get on the right road, you actually have to look for it. Uh, to find life, to find wisdom, uh, you have to hear, you have to listen, you have to get, you have to guard, you have to watch at the gates, you have to wait by the doors, and then you have to hold on and not let go. So if you don't make those choices of the right option by default, you will be on the road to a funeral. What does it say in verse 36? He who fails to find me injures himself. So choosing not to choose is a choice. Um, If the right choice is obvious, why do we struggle to make this right choice? Well, as we've said this before, second thing here, because the choice is hard. It's hard. Um, It's not the easy road. Um, It's hard because in a fallen world, uh, first thing, we have this bent towards foolishness. Um, another way to look at this is uh, original sin. Okay, we were born with this bent. Now, human beings were not always this way. If you know your Bible, Genesis 1 and 2, it says, when God created um, the heavens and the earth, everything in it, including men, it says what? That it was very good. Proverbs 8 is telling us that when God did this, when God created the world, wisdom was right there at the beginning of creation. I mean, talk about setting us up for a beautiful, wonderful, amazing life in this world that God created. Look at chapter 8, starting in verse 22. Wisdom says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his work, the first of his acts of old, Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of creation, when there were no depths, I was brought forth, when there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains had been shaped, before the hills, I was brought forth, before he had made the earth with its fields, or the first of the dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there, when he drew a circle on the face of the deep. When he made firm the skies above, when he established the fountains of the deep, when he assigned to the sea its limit so that the waters might not transgress his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him like a master workman, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always, rejoicing in his inhabited world and delighting in the children of man. That's amazing. It's wonderful. God made a beautiful, wonderful world. What did we do with this offer of life and wisdom that was given to us at creation? I mean, Adam and Eve had a pretty sweet deal. You think? What did they do with it? They turned their backs on it. Hey, Genesis 3, man chose to sin. And we have all followed suit. I mean, we continue to choose sin, to turn our backs on God. The Bible talks about this, that we've inherited this bent, this tendency toward sin and foolishness, even at birth. Now, babies are pretty awesome. You know, it's pretty awesome to see baby Hebron this morning. But uh, it's not because they're without sin. Ask any mom. Sin eventually shows up. Uh, Proverbs 22.15 says this. Folly is bound up where? In the heart of a child. But the rod of discipline drives it far from him. 
So this voice of folly that's inviting us to her feast, folly knows that we have this bent bound up in our hearts from birth. Folly knows that for some reason, stolen water is sweet, unjust gain, something for nothing, anything forbidden seduces us. I mean, Adam and Eve had everything at their disposal. There was only one thing. They were told, don't do this. And what did they do? They did it. <laughs> it seduces us. Okay. The right choice is a more difficult road because we have this bent. But secondly, because in a fallen world, we are captives to darkness. Colossians 1.13 says this, that God has delivered us from the domain of darkness, transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So, so not only do we have this bent, this sin nature, uh, there's actually a slave master. There's an evil ruler who has domain. Okay, the Bible is actually saying here that darkness, evil, has some authority over men and women who've not yet been delivered or transferred to a new authority, to God's authority by faith. So to the person who is not saved, the voice of folly that is calling out to them, inviting them to their house, it's almost an irresistible command because they are under the dominion of darkness. Now to those of us who've been redeemed, who've been saved, we're not under that authority anymore. But habits, old habits are hard to break. Our, our sin nature, that bent inside of us, still knows the voice of its old master. And it's why we have to actively lean in and choose to listen to God. It's so important. Not a perfect illustration, but it would be like uh, you were on a ship and you are one of the crew, and the, the old slave master is the captain of the ship and barking out orders that you have to obey, so you're, you're obeying the old ship captain. Until one day, there's a mutiny, and the authority of the old ship captain is broken. You are free now. You're not under the authority of the old captain, but the old captain is still on the boat. And the old captain comes up on deck and starts barking out orders. And we're so trained to hear the voice of the old captain, we just start doing what the old captain says. It's like, no, you've been set free. You're not under the authority of the old captain anymore. But see, it's, it's hard because third thing is we have histories. We're not blank slates. We have these habits, we have these rhythms of life that, that need to be reshaped. Christ has saved us, he's redeemed us, he's rescued us. But the process of sanctification is real. We are being made holy. We are working out our salvation. We're not earning it. Our eternal destiny is secure, but our experience of godliness is being formed in us as we follow Jesus. And it's not just some sort of passive process that somebody else is doing in our life. We must make choices every day. And how we respond to the process of sanctification in our lives, how, how we engage in it matters. Let's look at chapter 9, verses 7 to 9. Whoever corrects a scoffer gets himself abuse. And he who reproves a wicked man incurs injury. Do not reprove a scoffer, or he will hate you. Reprove a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a righteous man, and he will increase in learning. So 
you see, we can actually grow wiser. We can actually increase in learning. We can change. God will help you change, but it's hard because in a fallen world, fourth thing here, we're always looking for easier paths. And we talked about this in Proverbs 1 uh, because the way of wisdom it involves correction, it involves uh, discipline, it involves reproof. And frankly, it's a lot of work. The other reason we look for easier paths is, well, we get comfortable where we're at. If you've been following Jesus for a long time, you're just like, you know what? I made a lot of progress. I'm a lot better than a lot of people. I'm a lot better than I used to be. I think I'm going to just coast for a while. You know, we started off moving hard toward Jesus, but we level off. We find this comfortable place. And if you remember the illustration, we, instead of moving toward Jesus, we, we start orbiting Jesus. Know anybody like that? Proverbs 132 says, the complacency of fools does what? It destroys them. Don't take your foot off the gas in following Jesus. Don't swerve to the right or to the left. But remember that the biggest reason why we look for easier paths is we don't fear God. We don't give God weight in our lives and in our decisions. So follow God, fulfill my desires. What is it that I want? What is it that God wants? When God doesn't have weight, our desires have weight and our desires get their way. Without a healthy fear of the Lord, finding wisdom is elusive. Look at chapter 9, verses 10 to 11. It's the fear of the Lord that is the beginning of wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy One is insight, for by me your days will be multiplied, and years will be added to your life. All right, the choice is obvious. Uh, the right choice is clear, but the right choice is hard. Because life in a fallen world is, is, is prejudiced to foolishness. Uh, there's pressure. There's momentum to choose the wrong way. It's seductive. It's powerful. Wisdom and foolishness, they are both calling out to you. They're both saying, come, come, come. So which way will you go? To the, to the feast or to the funeral? We need to choose. And we need to consider because, third thing, the choice is yours. Look at chapter 9, verse 12. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. If you scoff, you alone will bear it. Okay, see, we, we were made to live in community. You're going to hear that over and over again here. It's not about Jesus and me. It's Jesus and we. Uh, that's true. We need one another. We cannot mature without others in our lives. But there are some things we cannot do for one another. We cannot repent for other people. We cannot turn to the Lord on behalf of others and believe for them. The fear of the Lord that leads us to knowledge and life and wisdom has to come from our own hearts. Life flows through our heart. It's the deepest part of us, our soul. It's, it's a part that communicates with God. It's the thing that sets you apart from all of creation uh, as being made in his image. And the people that you have in your life impact this decision for sure, but they cannot choose for you. So I want to walk through a few disclosures here in case you didn't know. First, your parents cannot choose for you, right? As a child, they train you up. They can exert their authority and influence for many years, but eventually kids grow up and they have to choose who they will serve. Now, I've met a lot of people who lean on the faith of their families mom or dad, it's often grandma, okay, uh, who had a strong faith, 
Oh, my grandma was really shit. She would take me to church. Um, it's like uh, they get some sort of credit for being in the family. Uh, like it's a club membership that gets passed down for generations. Uh, you know, it's not who you know, but it's not what you know, but, but it's who you know. A family is important. Wisdom and life and the fear of the Lord come from a decision, though, that's in our own hearts. Now, parents often feel the weight of this, especially when our children are choosing an evil path. Uh, they're not choosing the good path. It's easy as a parent to feel like we've failed when our children failed. Uh, but regardless of, of good or bad parenting, listen, each child, is responsible to make their own choice. Uh, one pastor has rightly said, God doesn't have grandchildren, only children. You get what that means? Okay. If you had great parents, be thankful for them. But their choice to follow Jesus is not your choice. You don't get credit. Um, now, if you had bad parents, here's the good news. You can change the equation. Uh, that's important to know. But also this uh, is true, in case you didn't know it. Your pastor cannot choose for you. All right? Now, the spiritual authority that you submit to in a local church, this is very important. Uh, we take that responsibility seriously. I take that responsibility. I have to give an account, Hebrews 13 says, uh, for those who have been entrusted to me. It's something, though, that has been abused. It has been distorted way too much in our world. Some of you have seen and experienced the devastation uh, from shepherds who did not tend their congregations well. And I've often said that the greatest challenge in our mission, frankly, is not a sinful world. We have the good news in response to that. It, the greatest challenge for me is distorted churches. But you cannot blame a bad pastor and use that as an excuse. You must choose wisdom. You must choose to follow the Lord in faith. Now, the other side of this coin is a superficial faith that actually attaches itself to a particular pastor or congregation, somehow hoping that their association with church ABC or pastor XYZ is the ticket. But that's not how it works. Uh, the path to life is not defined by the label or the brand or the lingo, a celebrity pastor, or a lifestyle kind of Christianity that you often see, especially in Bible Belt cultures, it's all kind of superficial. Now, saving faith and choosing the road of wisdom has to come from your own heart. And in case you didn't know this third thing, your spouse cannot choose for you. I know a lot of spouses who are trying, uh, no elbows. But I know that uh, some of you are feeling this burden right now. If your spouse is not following the Lord, it's this huge weight and burden. Uh, and we should certainly be doing everything we can to love them to Jesus, uh, first by being a faithful follower ourselves. I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about uh, simply, humbly, fervently following Jesus. Jesus ourselves, speaking the truth in love, praying for them earnestly, urging them to be reconciled to God. We should do that, but we cannot force them in their hearts to turn to God. Now, if you have a spouse who thinks that they'll get to slide into heaven behind you because that's where you're going, it's not true. Um, they must choose. I mean, if somebody's listening here and you're thinking, well, I'm going to get in because of my spouse. No, that's not how it works. 
There isn't anyone who can choose for you. Not a friend, not a teacher, not a coach, a boss. There's no one. So here's the invitation from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 20 and 23. It's not on the screen. I'm just going to read it to you from chapter 1, starting in verse 20. Again, wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. At the head of the noisy streets, she cries out. At the entrance of the city gates, she speaks. How long, O simple ones, will you love being simple? How long will scoffers delight in their scoffing and fools hate knowledge? If you turn at my reproof, here's, here's, this is great news. If you turn, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Okay, so which way are you going? First, a word for those who are heading to the feast. I hope that's most of you here. Uh, you have a story. You have a testimony of faith, of belief, of forgiveness. Uh, Jesus is your Lord. He's your Savior. You're following him on this difficult road of faith in a fallen world. Um, I, I want you to remember this book was written for people um, like you, to sons, to love children. So here's what we should do. If you're heading to the feast, first, embrace your identity. You are a son or daughter. You are free. Okay, embrace this identity. You're loved by God. Now live like you're loved. Okay, follow hard after Jesus. Don't grow complacent. Don't take your foot off the gas. You're not earning your way to heaven. You're already in the family photo. You're part of the team. Um, embrace that identity. Secondly, embrace God's forgiveness. Okay, there is forgiveness. There is life. No matter what your history has been. If, if Proverbs 5 to 7 that we looked at last week, if that's your story, if, if you're among those who have drank from the wrong well, there is forgiveness. 1 John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. 1 Corinthians 10 11 says, no temptation has seized you except what is common to man. God is faithful. He, he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But with the temptation, when that comes, he will also provide a way out a way of escape so that you can stand up under it, but you have to choose to take the exit. You have to choose uh, to get off the wrong road, and God, will, he's promising he'll provide a way out. Hebrews 2.18 says about Jesus, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is also able to help those who are being tempted. Why did Jesus suffer when he was tempted? Because he didn't give in. He was tempted just like us. But when you just give in to the temptation, you don't really suffer with the temptation because you just acquiesce. Jesus suffered because he didn't give in. And he, but he knows what it's like to be tempted. Um, and he will help you find the way of escape. Third thing, embrace God's gift. Embrace this opportunity. Go all in with God. Give all your heart. Give him all authority, all loyalty, all liability. Don't have plan B, C, and D. It's God or bust. He is faithful. Lean in with God. Lean in with others in the community. And now I want to give a word to those who are heading to the funeral. I don't know if anybody in the room or anybody who's listening might be on that road. I don't know who you are, but either by an active choice or a passive non-choice, the decisions you're making every day are leading you to a destination that's a funeral. Now, for some reason, you're hearing this. For some reason, you're here. You're listening to the video. Maybe somebody sent this to you. Um, maybe you found it on the internet. 
if you're here, maybe the person who invited you here encouraged you to come. Maybe they dragged you here um, because they love you. Why else would they take the risk to ask you to come or ask you to listen? But they cannot make you believe. They cannot choose life and wisdom for you. I, I know that they're not perfect not the point here at all. You know, if you're looking at the church or you're looking at Christians uh, through the eyes of a scoffer, you might think they're all hypocrites. But here's what a hypocrite actually is. Hypocrite is a word that means an actor. Uh, It means somebody's pretending to be something they are not. We are not pretending anything here. I mean, the gospel that we're believing in is good news because it's good news for imperfect people like us. We're honest. We're saying Jesus came to save us. We needed help. We were in big trouble. Um, He rescued us from the consequences of our sin. Amen? His invitation to you, if, if you are on the road to a funeral, is not, hey, clean up your life. Apply all this wisdom, and maybe if you're good enough, I'll let you into my feast. That's not the invitation. Jesus, who is the wisdom of God, is inviting you to come to him. Revelation 3.20, these are the words of Jesus. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. The feast that we're invited to is actually more and more of God in our lives. And when we eat and drink at his feast with him, when we believe, when we worship him, when we humbly come to his invitation, when we open the door, we get to experience more of him and life. If you've not believed, okay, the choice is obvious. I know the choice is hard, but the choice is yours. I hope you'll make that choice today. Pray with me. God, uh, thank you that you've made your word so clear here. We know that the the way to life is you. We know that you are knocking on the door. You're inviting us to open. You're inviting us to let you in so that we can eat with you, drink with you, experience you. So God, for those who haven't made that choice, May they hear the invitation right now and say, God, I'm ready to follow you. God, I want that life. I want to get off the wrong road. I want to get in the right road. I want to be in your family. Thank you for dying on a cross for me. Thank you for paying my penalty so that I can have life. I receive you as my Lord, as my Savior. Now, for those of us who are on the right road, here's what we're going to do. We're not dead. We're not done. If we're here, uh, we've got a pulse. we got a purpose. Amen? So my encouragement is let's embrace God. Let's embrace his gift. Um, Let's stand together.